All right, let's open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. We'll be in this passage for most of the lesson. Ephesians chapter number 1. We'll begin in verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 1 in verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. I would like to continue our study of the doctrine of salvation. We've covered many things, both from a doctrinal standpoint as well as a biblical perspective, and we've also touched on some things from a theological perspective as well as an ecclesiological perspective. In other words, what do theologians say about salvation? More importantly, what does the Bible say about salvation? And we've even touched on what churches say about salvation. But what we want to delve into here, especially in Ephesians chapter number 1, are some of the specifics of salvation. And I have it here on the board. What happened specifically to you when you trusted Christ as your personal Savior? When you think about some of the things we do in everyday life, uh, for instance, an online purchase. You go on your computer, you find something that you want. If you're going to make an online purchase, you click on it, you put it into your cart, you go to pay for it, and then you've got to enter in your shipping address, your billing address, put in your card information. You hit the button, and then they send you a confirmation email, and then eventually they send you the package, and you have it. But there's a lot that goes into that behind the scenes that we are not even aware of on this side of the order. There are computer transactions that are taking place. They're checking your bank account. They are going through computerized and they're finding out if you have enough money to pay for it. They're checking the address. They're sending that information to their shipping department. Then you have individuals that find the product, put it in the box, label it. It goes to the truck, it goes, all these things are happening and we're not really aware of that, but it all takes place with the click of a button. So there's a transaction that takes place, but there are subsequent things that happen the very moment we decide to make that transaction. When you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, a transaction took place. You said yes to the cure for your sin problem which is the Lord Jesus Christ. You received Him as your personal Savior. And all kind of things took place that you were really unaware of and maybe might still be unaware of. As a matter of fact, there are some things reserved in glory and some things about heaven that we don't even know yet. And He says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. So when you trusted Christ, a lot of things happened, but you might not have been aware that they happened. Another good example of this in modern day is when you jump in the car. Nowadays, they don't have keys. They have just a key fob, I guess. You keep it in your pocket. You open your door. You get in. You push your button. The car cranks up. It starts. 
and then you put it in drive, put the foot on the gas, go down the road. Well, there's a lot of things taking place. There's an explosion taking place over and over and over inside of your engine. Fuel is being burned. There's a computer that's being charged and run by a battery. If that battery dies, your car dies. The old time cars, I remember some of my old vehicles I had. If I knew that I had a battery that was dying, I could at least start the car or start the truck and jump it off and then ride to wherever I needed to go just because the uh, alternator would keep everything going. Not so today. Not even in cars that are 20 years old. I'm talking about cars 30 and 40 years old. But cars have to have those computers. They have to have everything running behind the scenes. You don't know what's going on. You're just going down the road. Consequently, in our Christian life, when we got saved, there's a lot of things that took place the Bible does tell us about that we might not have been aware of, and I think this will encourage you. I want you to notice the emphasis here in Ephesians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice your spiritual life is very important. Now the world tends to put emphasis on the flesh. The world puts emphasis on your health. The world puts emphasis on even your emotional stability and your psychological stability and leaves out your spiritual life. If you're not right with God, if you're not close to God, your life is going to be in shambles. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. You were made to please God for His pleasure, the Bible tells us. And if you're not pleasing God, you're not going to be spiritually or emotionally or psychologically stable. And so it's very important that you understand the spiritual blessings. And you ask somebody, how are you doing? They say, I'm doing great. And you might look at them on the outside and their life looks like it's falling to pieces. They might not have any money. They might uh, not have many good things materially. But if they know Jesus Christ, they can say that joy fills their soul. They can say that they have peace with God and they're walking with God. They know they have a home in heaven and they have uh, a joy in their heart because they have spiritual blessings. I think sometimes we underestimate the, the emphasis that God puts on our walk with Christ. And we want to put it all on the physical and all on the emotional. Notice here in the text that it's spiritual blessings in heavenly places, not on the earth. And notice it's in Christ, not in yourself or not in Adam. Now we're going to look at some things here, and this is not an exhaustive message covering all the different things that happened to you when you trusted Christ. But most of these will come out of Ephesians chapter number 1. I want you to notice first of all, Verse number 4, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. So the first one that we'll talk about here is the adoption of children. And we've mentioned adoption previously. And we've talked about how that adoption in the Bible is, of course, one of the ways that you get into the family of God. But adoption in Scripture, when it refers to the believer, it, there's a few things associated with it. Notice in verse number 4, the word chosen. And then notice also in verse number 5, the word predestinated. And sometimes people get scared when they see those words and they think, oh no, this is some kind of idea that's been formulated and pushed around that God just chose and picked people before they were ever even created either to be saved and go to heaven or to be lost and go to hell and that is not what the Bible means by these words at all notice in verse number four yes God has chosen someone but notice he ch has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world now, if God chose someone in Christ before the foundation of the world, how can He choose someone in Christ before Jesus Christ is born? And how can He choose someone that's in Christ when someone is born on this earth in Adam? 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die. When you were born in this world, you were born a sinner by birth, and you come from the heritage of Adam. That's why you're said to be a son of Adam. 
It's not until you trust Christ as your personal Savior that you're said to be a child of God or a son of God. And a son of God is a direct creation from God. Adam is said to be a son of God in, in the book of Luke, Luke chapter number 3. We know that when Adam had a son named Seth, the Bible says he had a son after his own image and after his own likeness. And we know that when God created Adam, he created Adam in his image after God's own likeness. So until you're saved, you're a son of Adam. But when you get saved, you're a son of God. So there's no way that this is saying that all of a sudden you were put in Christ before you ever made, then you go out of Christ, you're put in Adam, and then you go out of Adam back into Christ. That's crazy. Notice also the text when you look at Ephesians 1 verse number 4, according as he hath chosen us. Who is the us in the passage? The us, obviously, is believers. How do you become a believer? You make a choice to believe. God made a choice about a group of people that would make a choice to trust Christ. He chose that group to be in Christ. And notice also the word predestinated. It's used twice here and it's used twice in the book of Romans. We've covered this in previous lessons. But notice the predestination has to do with the adoption of children. And come over to Romans chapter number 8 and notice that the adoption of children has to do Romans chapter number 8, verse number 14, it has to do with the completion of your salvation in respect to your redemption. We're going to talk about redemption in a little bit, so we won't belabor the point. But you've only been partially saved. Your body hasn't been saved yet. Okay, so notice in Romans chapter number 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And so as he talks about this adoption, he talks about being an heir of God, verse 17. Then he goes on in verses 18 and 19, he talks about suffering and talks about glory. Come all the way down to verse number 23. And not only they... But ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. So I'll go ahead and just write these verses down for you here under adoption. We'll put uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 down through verse number 23. So God has adopted you, however, your adoption's not complete because your body hasn't been changed. The sinfulness of your body hasn't been changed into the glory that you're going to get with your glorified, sinless body. So the adoption, what is this? You see the words of adoption, chosen predestination. We see the way of adoption. It takes you out of one family and puts you into another. We understand that. You've been taken out of the devil's family, Ephesians chapter number 2, and you've been put into God's family. Thank God for that. You are no longer the child of the devil. You are no longer someone that has to follow what the devil dictates. You're not in bondage anymore. You don't have to do what the world tells you. You don't have to do what the devil tells you. You are in a new family. And one day you're going to be united with that family both in heaven and in earth and will be gathered together around that throne. The wonders of adoption. It guarantees that our physical bodies will be made like unto Christ. You'll notice also, if you're still in Romans chapter number 8, look over there in verse number 29, you'll see that word predestinate. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. When we talk about being predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, oftentimes we use a devotional application and say, yeah, I'm trying to be like Christ, I'm still working on that, and that's okay, but this is a literal, physical adoption. So what's going to take place? Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. You're a son of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, 1 John 3. But we know when we see him, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. He'll change our vile body that it may be fashioned like into his glorious body. So God has predestinated, he has predetermined that those who trusted Christ, and yes, he foreknew that, but just because God knows something doesn't mean he makes it happen. God knows what I'm going to do in the next five minutes. 
But I have a will to do what I do. And so, therefore, the person makes the choice to receive Christ. He's in that group that God has chosen to say, they are going to be conformed to the image of my son. They are going to be new creatures in Jesus Christ. Thank God for the adoption. People say, what is adoption? Well, there was a story where this classroom was having a discussion. This teacher had these little kids and they were looking at uh, some pictures of families and they were talking just about social structure and so forth. And here's a family and, and they had the mother and father and they had the kids. And one of the kids had red hair or something and didn't look like the other kids. So some of the other uh, the classmate says, well, I suggest that uh, maybe that kid was adopted. And they got to talking about that, and one of the kids says, what is adoption? What, what are you talking about? What do you mean adoption? And then one of the other kids blurted out and said, I'll tell you all about adoption because I was adopted. And they said, well, what is adoption? And, she, and, she, and the little girl said, I don't know exactly all, the, all that it's about, but I'll tell you, my mother told me this. Adoption is when God loves you. I mean, not when God loves you, but when you're your mother, let me get the thing right, I messed it up. <laughs> I know all about adoption because I was adopted, she said. And they said, what does it mean? She says that you grew in your mommy's heart instead of her tummy. You grew in your mommy's heart instead of her tummy. And so we've been saved, we've been put into the family of God, we've been adopted into God's family. G.H. Harding wrote, why did he love me? I never can tell. Why did he suffer? to save me from hell. Nothing but infinite grace from above could have conceived such a story of love. Notice verse number 6 back in Ephesians chapter number 1. Notice the second thing here, Ephesians chapter number 1. Come down to verse number 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. We have been accepted in the Beloved. Of course, the beloved would be the group. We've been put into this privileged group, and thank God for that. People have a problem with acceptance. Oftentimes, people try to gain self-esteem by being accepted by their peers, maybe by their friends, or even by their families, maybe by their mothers or their fathers. They want someone to admire them, to respect them, to think good of them, and they want to feel that because they are trying to build themselves up to have value, to respect themselves, so they want to be accepted. And some people, the problems with this are, are so many. Sometimes people go to extremes and do things out of character, sometimes even dangerous things, crazy things, to be accepted by people. And it's ridiculous some of the things people do to impress people. Like the old saying is, you spend money you don't have to try to impress people you don't even like. And oftentimes that's the case with people. This idea of being accepted to be part of something bigger than you are. You see it oftentimes in the sports world. You have people and they're all consumed about their team and they're talking about their team. They can't wait till Monday morning where they can stand around the water cooler or the coffee pot. And they can talk about the big game on Sunday and they'll talk about how coach messed up here and coach messed up there and star player number one was off his game and I know what happened to him. He's doing this and they go through all the stats and they like to talk like they have ownership. They'll say, yeah, we. We could have done better if we would have done such and such. They buy the shirts, they buy the coffee mugs, they spend thousands of dollars to go see the games, motels, all those kind of things, so they can have and be a part of something bigger than they are. It's acceptance. They want to be part of something. And I believe that's in the heart of all of us. And there's a place in your heart God has placed where you have a desire. There's something inside you that needs God. And we are accepted in the beloved. When you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, He accepted you warts and all. And I know people may look down at you. They might not like you. Maybe your personality is not as, as good as theirs. And maybe you don't come off right when you talk to people. And maybe you can't come up with the jokes all the time. And you're not very good with conversation. And maybe people don't like you. But if you're saved, if you trusted Christ... He accepts you just like you are. Warts in every bit of it. He loves you. He accepts you. No strings attached. If God accepts you, 
Who gives a flip what everybody else thinks about you? Now look, I'm not saying you shouldn't be polite and you shouldn't be kind and you shouldn't have friends. You shouldn't have a church family. I'm not saying be a nomad and go out and uh, dig a hole, stick your head in it. But I'm saying this. We've got this idea that you've got to have all these likes. You've got to have all these friends. You've got to have this influence of all these people around you. And you've got to be liked by people in order to be built up. And that you're headed for a fall. You have kids and even adults killing themselves because they lack and they get bullied because they don't have acceptance by people and all these kind of things. If God accepts you, who cares what everybody else thinks? Notice that verse number 6 tells us, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. God accepts you because of His grace. He saved you by grace and He accepts you by grace. There are no strings attached. God is love. And you trusted Christ, He said, I will forgive you and I will accept you just like you are. You come, like the song says, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That thou bidst me come to the old Lamb of God, I come. You come as a sinner, and he accepts you. You know, David recounts this, and it's a particular wording that the King James Bible uses. And I, I'm, I favor this wording. And you know exactly what he's saying. He's just basically making the statement that God had placed him on the throne. It was God's choice to put David there. He understands that. But the phrase that he uses is this. First Chronicles 28, verse number 4. I'll give you this so you can look it up. 1 Chronicles 28, verse number 4, David uses this phrase. He says, God, he says, he liked me to make me king over all Israel. He says, he liked me. Aren't you glad God likes you? Nobody else might not like you. That's all right. God likes you. G. Campbell Morgan was a great a preacher at Westminster. And, of course, after G. Campbell Morgan, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones took over during the war years and had great revivals and, and things like that back in that time. But G. Campbell Morgan, as a young man, he tried to qualify as a Wesleyan minister. And along with 150 other applicants, he went and to this huge auditorium that would seat several thousand people in front of three preachers and had to preach a message. There were about 75 or so others that came to listen. Of course, he was nervous, and of course, the intimidation overtook him, and he just felt like he did a terrible job. And several days later, when they posted on the board the other 105 that had been rejected for ordination and ministry, his name was on the list. He wired his dad and he said to his father, Rejected, very dark everything seems, still he knoweth best. His, di his dad wired him back and said, Rejected on earth, but accepted in heaven. You know, men may reject you down here, but if you serve Jesus Christ and He accepts you, that's all that matters. Your self-worth is built up in Christ. I'll give you another verse you can jot down. I'll put it up here for you real quick. Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 10. Colossians 2, 10. He says, Ye are complete in Him. God made you a certain way. You have all your past and everything that figures into all of your circumstances. He knows all about that. You are complete in Him. You don't have to be fulfilled by trying to live up to some lost dream that your mother or father had from you or, or whatever messed you up in your formative years. So many people are messed up because homes, quite frankly, have been destroyed for years and years and years now. And people are dealing with a lot of issues. In Jesus Christ, you find your completeness. You've been accepted by Christ, so let's move on. Let's don't live in the past. Let's move forward and realize when you made that choice to trust Christ, you were put into the best family you ever could hope for. Amen. Verse number 7. Come back to Ephesians chapter number 1. Verse number 7. Ephesians chapter number 1. Look in verse number 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. We have a couple here. And the first one I will give you here will be acquired. You've been acquired. And I'm just using A's for sake of alliteration. But he says, in whom we have redemption. And I'll give you Galatians 3.13. He talks about redemption. 
Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Uh, another verse will be 1 Peter uh, 1, 18 and 19. You were redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot. In Revelation chapter number 5, this is a good verse. I'll give this one to you as well. Revelation chapter number 5, verse number 9. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And hast made under us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. We've been redeemed to God by God the blood. What does it mean to redeem? It's to acquire. It's to purchase. God has redeemed you. When you trusted Christ, maybe you didn't understand all this about redemption. You didn't understand all of this about God purchasing you. God has purchased a possession. Of course, it's tied into adoption some. He signed some adoption papers and there's a part of you that was saved, but part of you, your body hadn't been saved. This old flesh hasn't been redeemed yet. However, you have been redeemed. Your soul has been redeemed. We've studied previously the fact that your spirit has been born again and God acquired you. He purchased you. You're hanging up there in the pawn shop for sale. And he comes in there and he purchases you. And he purchases you with the most precious substance in all the universe. The precious blood of Jesus Christ. We sing the song, Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Sometime when you get a chance, just read through briefly the Song of Solomon. Eight chapters. And go through there and you'll read some phrases like this. The, the woman will say... I am my beloved's. And then she'll say, my beloved's is mine. There's ownership that goes both ways. When a person, when two people become a husband and wife, they become one. They belong to each other. Each other's body is reserved for the other person. And so that's the holiness of marriage. And so this idea of redemption obviously is tied into the fact that he has purchased us for him. Why should we go off and serve some other master? Why should we go off and, and court some other lover? We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's redeemed us. He showed his love in that he gave his life for us on the cross and lay down his life and shed his precious blood for us. We've been redeemed. We've been purchased. Notice also back in Ephesians chapter 1, look down in verse number 7. Ephesians chapter 1, look down in verse 7 again. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins. So we'll say we've been absolved. We've been forgiven. Your sins have been forgiven. I'll give you a few verses on this. Um, Romans 4, 7, and 8. Romans 4, 7, and 8. He describes the blessedness of imputation and forgiveness. He says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Okay, so if your sins have been absolved, that means... They've been forgiven. Now when we talk about forgiven, forgiveness, and I'll just give you some of these Bible terms. They're theological terms, but they're Bible terms. We've already given you redemption. And these are T-I-O-N words, many of them. We talked some previously about propitiation. Here we're talking about redemption, and then we're talking about forgiveness. But then we have this word imputation. What does it mean as far as imputing something? Okay, well, imputing has to, to input something. So that means you impute something to someone's account here, and you impute something to someone's account there. Our sins were imputed to Christ. Christ's righteousness was imputed to us. So we were forgiven of all trespasses. How did that happen? How could God just say, I forgive you? You say, well, God's a God of love, so He just forgives. God's holy, and He's just. A just God cannot just bypass sin. He cannot clear iniquity. A good judge could never let 
crimes go unpunished or he would not be a good judge. You wouldn't think a good police officer would let somebody get away with a crime right in front of him. God can't do that. God is holy. God's a balanced being. He does want to forgive, but he also is holy and he must be a God of justice and judgment. How is that reconciled? It's reconciled by the cross. Because on the cross we have the judgment of God where sins are paid for. And judgment and justice is enacted upon Christ. Our sins are placed on Him. Therefore, we can be forgiven because the sins have been paid for. If our sins have not been paid for, we can't be forgiven. So why does somebody go to hell? They go to hell because of unbelief. Because their sins, although they were paid for, they were not imputed to Christ in the sense of they did not take Christ as their payment. Therefore, their sins are still on them. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, your sins were taken off of your account and they were put on Christ's account. Christ's righteousness and sinlessness was taken off of His account and was put on your account. That's how God can forgive you. And so when we talk about imputation, that's what it is. Blessed is the man whom God will not impute sin. God cannot attribute sin to you because in His eyes... You are as his son. The son of righteousness has blinded out the father's eyes and he doesn't see your sin at all. That is your sins being absolved. Thank God for that. And that comes by belief in Christ. In Acts chapter number 13, another thing that goes along with forgiveness, although sometimes people get them confused and they put them together, they confuse justification with forgiveness. Justification is not forgiveness. It's not pardon. But justification is a judicial act whereby God declares the sinner completely free from sin. So when we talk about your sins being absolved, we can definitely talk about forgiveness. We understand the idea of forgiving someone. I mean, you committed a sin. And God says, I forgive you. But God has a basis by which he does that. So we understand that. And we also can understand justification in some sense. But in the biblical sense, justification is as, is, as, is, as if you never sinned. He sees you as righteous because Christ is in your place. So when we say Christ died for my sins and we say Jesus took your place, there's a lot behind that. Your sins have been absolved. I have a few more here. Look down in verses 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of of his glory. So now we have obviously in verses 13 and 14 a reference to the Holy Spirit. You'll notice in verse number 13, in whom you also trusted. So all these things took place when you trusted Christ. You made a decision to believe. And this belief is not just a head belief, it's a heart belief, and it's likened unto trusting. When I lean on this pulpit, I'm trusting that it's going to hold me up. That's the difference in a head belief, sitting back here saying, you know what, that structure is fairly well, I know it's square, I know it's got some weight to it, so it can probably sustain, and I'm going to try to calculate uh, the physics of this and how this works when a body moves toward it and the weight, how it leans, and how the weight is actually increased because of the, uh, the uh, angle. That's a whole different deal than doing this. When I do this, I'm putting my trust on this pulpit. So we talk about believing in your head and believing in your heart. That's the difference. And when someone trusts Christ, it's one thing to know a good physician, a good surgeon. You say, yeah, so-and-so did great work and, and he put a new knee on me and now i got this new knee. It's great. He's going to do a great job for you. And you can have all the facts. You can hear all the testimony. But until you go and talk, talk to the anesthesiologist and you let him knock you out and you lay on the table and let the surgeon, you don't trust him. So a lot of people have head belief. We're talking about belief in Jesus Christ to the point to where you forsake yourself and you trust Him. Faith, forsaking all, I trust Him. F-A-I-T-H. Forsaking all, I trust Him. So what is this? Verse number 13, after you trusted, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So here, you are anointed. 1 John chapter number 2 makes reference to the Holy Spirit. 
1 John chapter number 2, verse number 27, it says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. The same anointed teacheth you of all things. And so that's 1 John 2, 27. When we talk about the anointing, we talk about the Holy Spirit because the oil in the Bible, the olive oil, is a type of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Spirit of God. I'll give you a few other verses on this. Uh, Galatians chapter number 2, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Romans chapter number 6, the Bible says, We're buried with Him by baptism into death. So when you trust to Christ as your personal Savior, you are baptized into Christ. I think we gave you these verses before in Colossians chapter number 2, verses 11, 12, 13. In there, yeah, Colossians 2, 11, 12, and 13. You're buried with Him by baptism. So you're put into Christ. This all takes place with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the believer and puts you into Christ. Now you'll notice in this text it says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit. So you've been sealed. You've been put into Christ. Now, if you're in Christ, you're bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh, Ephesians chapter number 5. You can't lose your salvation because you're sealed. You are sealed kind of like when they had the old letters and they'd seal those letters. You don't open the letters until they get to where they're going. God's not going to open the letter until you get to where you're going. You take those preserves, they take them and they seal them. And when you, uh, when, when you heat them up to have them sealed, you, that thing will click. It'll be a little, that thing is sealed. And so this idea that a believer can fall out of Jesus Christ is foreign to Paul's epistles. There may be passages in the Bible referring to other groups outside of the church age in which we live, like back in the Old Testament or in the future Great Tribulation period, that can lose their salvation. But nobody, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ up to the rapture of the church, can lose their salvation if they're saved. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You're in Ephesians. Look over in chapter number 4. Same book. Look in Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 30. Ephesians 4, verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You say, what is that? That's this thing about adoption. Being redeemed, there's a day of redemption, Romans chapter number 8, Ephesians chapter number 4, that your body is going to be taken into heaven. That's going to take place at the rapture, or if you die in Christ, that will take place at the resurrection when the body is redeemed, and you are sealed until that day. So you, so you talk about a spiritual blessing. So what happened when I got saved? Well, I was adopted into God's family. I was accepted into God's family. I was acquired into God's family. I was absolved from all my sins. I was anointed by the Holy Spirit of God, sealed unto the day of redemption, guaranteed. Notice verse number 14 back in Ephesians chapter number 1. It's called a down payment. The earnest of the inheritance. An earnest payment when they have loans and so forth is so much you put down. God has put a down payment on every believer, and that is the Holy Spirit inside of you. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, he mentions that as well. I'll give you the uh, cross-reference here. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 22. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 1, 22. Now let me give you this, and that just real briefly, you can jot down the references. Luke chapter 24, verse 49, when Jesus Christ tells the apostles, He says, I'm going to give you a promise of the Father. And He's speaking of the Holy Spirit. He's not referring to when He breathed on them, because He tells them in Acts chapter number 1, you tarry in Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. They're waiting for the day of Pentecost that you read about in Acts chapter number 2. In verse number 33, the Bible tells us, Acts chapter 2, verse number 33, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. That's what Peter's making reference to, the promise of the Holy Ghost. 
So when you talk about the formation of the body of Christ and how the apostles are realizing this thing about being baptized into the body of Christ, that's what this thing is referencing. And you know this because in Acts chapter 11, when Paul excuse me, Peter is telling the apostles about what took place with Cornelius, a Gentile. He says, look, I was preaching to them and all of a sudden they spoke in tongues and then I understood that they had the Holy Spirit, that they had the same thing that the promise of the Father took place to them. So they understood as Jews that God was now giving the Holy Spirit and by doing that he was putting them into the body of Jesus Christ. So when you talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that takes place when you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You're buried with Him in baptism. First of all, you're crucified with Him on the cross. Your sins are on the cross. The old man is on the cross. The old man is buried with Him in baptism. You're risen to walk in newness of life. And then also, Ephesians 1, you're seated in heavenly places in Christ. You are in Jesus Christ and He's inside of you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So why do you have all the tongues and stuff? That has to do with the nation of Israel. Those were signs to show that God was doing something to the nation of Israel there. That has nothing to do with somebody having initial evidence of being saved. Don't buy into that at all. Because if they can speak in tongues, they can do some of the other signs. You say, what is that? Pick up deadly snakes and have them bite them and they won't die. Drink deadly poison and raise people from the dead and cast out devils. They just want to pick and choose the gifts that they have the ability to manipulate people by way of parlor tricks. Two more and we'll be done real quick. Verses 13 and 14 back in Ephesians chapter number 1. All this ties together. And there are many, many more. This is not an exhaustive study. I just wanted to stay kind of in one text here to look at this. But notice verses 13 and 14 he mentions that we've also trusted Christ, and we have the earnest of the inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So here I move on to submit to you that we have assurance. Because we have a down payment. Now, of course, this is a little different than the others. You might not have initial assurance because you don't know all the verses. But God will assure you, and you've got guaranteed proof from the Bible that you're saved. If you trusted Christ, you're in the family. You're in the family by birth, you're in the family by adoption, you're in the family by marriage. People have problems with assurance, but God doesn't lie. Notice the payment of assurance here is the down payment of the Holy Spirit, verse number 14. Romans 8, 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of of God. And so God gives you that assurance. And if you don't have assurance, you need to ask God to help you with that. And He will. And He's given a record. You need to base your experience on truth. And if you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior, this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. You say, well, I've messed up. Yeah, that's why we have prayer. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You've been absolved from all transgression, judicially. But as far as fellowship goes, positionally, remember our last lesson? Positionally, you're in Christ. Practically, you might be in a mess. Positionally, you are perfect in Christ. Practically, you got a whole lot of work you need to be working on here. So assurance of salvation goes back to you being in that Word and letting that Word have a work on your heart to help assure your heart where you know that you know Christ as your personal Savior. And then I'll give you one more A. We're made, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 20. We're made an ambassador. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. He says, Now then, ye are ambassadors... For God, I said 20. Now then, he says, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We have all these blessings. Now, here's some, these last two are kind of results. 
Now we have assurance that we know that we're saved. We know some of these things have happened to us. And what a blessing that is to the praise of His glory and His grace. We don't say that we have these things because of anything we've done. All these things that we have are because of what He's done. And then as a result, we have peace, we have assurance, but then we also are now a, represent, a representative for Christ. We are an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador is someone sent from a foreign country to be a go-between between one country and another. We have a new country, New Jerusalem, a heavenly country, a new city. We're foreigners. We shouldn't fit in down here. And therefore, we beseech others to trust Christ as their personal Savior so they can go to that city where we're going. We didn't know all this when we first got saved. And maybe some of you were not aware of these things. Maybe some of you already had all this down. This is all review. But it's a good review. We all need this. These are things that took place the very moment you trusted Christ. And God already had all this thing settled. All of it was taken care of by Christ and by His amazing grace. These blessings should affect us. How is your spiritual life. You're seated in heavenly places in Christ. We have these spiritual blessings. Are these spiritual blessings affecting your practical life? Let's pray that God would use these blessings to encourage us and help us. Lord, we do thank you for these blessings. Lord, uh, many times we're not aware of these things or we need to be reminded of all that you've done. You've forgiven us. You've saved us. You adopted us. You've fixed it to where even when we fall, we fall in Christ. And Lord, we mess up. But Lord, you help us. And we know we're going to heaven. And we know that you've got these things taken care of. Lord, help us to, number one, praise you. And then number two, propagate the truth. To be a good witness, a good testimony to those who don't know this. To those who don't have the peace of God. To those who don't have the ex acceptance that they need. They're trying to find pleasure and they're trying to find acceptance in all these places. Instead of trying to find it with you. And God we pray that you might help us to have an effect on the world around us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this book. Thank you for these truths. We pray that you go with us now in Jesus name. Amen.